So this year I'm doing a talk on BGP again, obviously. Uh, I've entitled it Operating Your Own BGP Autonomous System on the Internet, aka BGP for Fun and Profit, maybe in brackets, on a budget. Uh, I just, maybe I should have put more ghosts. <clears throat> so who am I? Uh, so I'm currently a network architect at Damon Defense Systems and Xyro. I'm an avid uh, open source user. Um, kind of a fanatic, and also recently kind of a contributor as well. Uh, I'm addicted to BGP, even my house runs BGP. I'm super obsessed with network monitoring and routing, and I often write about that on my website, bgp.guru. Um, I'm also involved in several not-for-profits in Winnipeg. I'm on the board of the Manitoba Internet Exchange, as well as the operations team, and I'm also on the board of Coldhack. Uh, Coldac is a not-for-profit dedicated to furthering privacy, security, and freedom of speech. And we run a handful of Tor relays and exits. And that's actually been most of the reason for me to be doing BGP, actually. Uh, I was also recently selected as a CBC Manitoba 2017 Future 40 finalist, uh, as of like this Thursday. <laughs> So what is BGP? So BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol. We're currently at version 4. You'll sometimes see that referred to as BGP4. Uh, Wikipedia defines it as a, a standardized exterior gateway protocol designed to exchange routing and reachability information among autonomous systems on the internet. Um, it's open and extensible, which is part of the reason why it's been so successful. And there's a large list of RFCs that add features and modify BGP's behavior. And uh, this year, I was actually recognized as a, uh, a contributor, not, a, not an author, but a contributor to an RFC, which was something that I was kind of, I wanted to, to become involved in that. Um, and as a result of BGP being open and extensible, there's other address families. So uh, layer 2 VPN, eVPN, and flow spec, which is used for DDoS mitigation. Oops. Uh, so the other part of BGP is your autonomous system, or autonomous system number. And Wikipedia defines that uh, an AS is a collection of connected internet protocol routing prefixes under the control of one or more network operators on behalf of a single administrative entity or domain that presents a common, clearly defined routing protocol on the internet. Pro policy, sorry. Um, so that could be like an ISP. Um, sometimes ISPs, when they get really large, decide to get more than one because they have a different routing policy. That's you know defined in the end there. Um, internet backbones as well operate autonomous systems, uh, EDUs, enterprise networks, and end users such as myself. Um, the autonomous refers to the, the BGP routing policy. And it's, uh, it's possible for a system to not be autonomous as well. That's usually a problem, but not always. And ASs are assigned by RIRs like Aaron in the North American region, RIPE in the, the European region, and AP NIC in the EMCA region, EMEA. Asia Pacific region. <clears throat> uh, and then the other part that I mentioned was routing policy. And the routing policy is how the routes are chosen within your autonomous system. So you could just be leaving it at defaults and just let BGP do its thing. It does pretty good. Um, that might be determined by your needs and budget. Maybe you don't have $100,000 to, to buy really expensive routers to hold full tables. And so you want to work with defaults or defaults and uh, you know a subset of routes. You might have two links with unequal uh, cost, like monetary cost, uh, unequal performance, unequal throughput rate. Um, you might have like a transit connection plus an internet exchange connection, or maybe a primary and a backup or perhaps a primary, a backup, and an internet exchange connection. Um, 
It's also determined by the number of routes that are installed. So yeah, if you need your full transit, partial, default route only. Um, and then the other part of routing policy is a special routing policies. So things like, like black hole injection. And I'm going to cover that later on as well because that's pretty important. So why would you even want to use BGP? Um, BGP is, is the best practice standards based way of doing dynamic routing with outside networks. Um, it gives you control of your routing policy. So if you're like an eyeball network, like a residential ISP, you're mostly inbound. So you can get some control over inbound by having one or more links. Uh, if you're an outbound network, like a content or a content delivery network, then you have an exceptional amount of control. And uh, enterprises are kind of a mix of both because there's often a mix of uh, outbound hosted applications as well as uh, users surfing within that ISP space as well too. Um, maybe you want to originate your own public IP addresses before v6. That's one of the reasons I do it. Uh, another reason that you'd want to use BGPE is automated DDoS mitigation, um, which could be done with um, remote triggered black hole injection or with BGP flow spec if you have that capability. That would not be on the budget side of the, uh, the scale. So why do I personally use BGP? Control of my routing policy is a big one. Uh, I originate public IP addresses. I have a slash 24 of IPv4 space, which I applied for on the day that Aaron announced their waiting list. That was my big push. I also have a slash 40 of IPv6 space. That's approximately 256 sites worth of IPv6 space. Um, I also use BGP because I want to read the global BGP routing tables. I'm interacting with BGP through software to, to store routes and to, to look at Manitoban routing. Um, also, I want to experiment with BGP, so I'm doing AnyCast on IPv6 as well as IPv4 within my own system. Um, on the experimenting with BGP, I'm also building and using communities to, to modify routing policy and working with my upstream to build communities that um, give additional functionality. Um, one of the other reasons I'm doing BGP is uh, so that I can offer BGP v6 tunnels to people who want to get v6 and I have two routers so you may as well have two tunnels to me and do it in a dynamic way rather than than not. <clears throat> um, and then I'm also doing black hole injection for DDoS mitigation. I've had several DDoSs, which I cover later on here. Uh, so the process to get to do BGP. So I actually started at one, but process or uh, step zero was to actually go to the company's office and register a company. So I've registered Hextet Systems so that I can have a company so that I can interact with Aaron as a company. Uh, after you have your company, then you can set up your, your Aaron account and validate your organization. So when you validate your organization, that's where they, they want to find out, like, is this company actually real? So in Manitoba, the new companies are only posted online for 90 days. So you kind of want to get all your ducks in a row and, and make all these things happen at once, because otherwise then you're going to have to pay for a $40 certificate as well. Um, you also need to find an upstream and make some tentative arrangements. So that could be like a contract with, uh, with no start date. I hear Jonathan laughing. <laughs> uh, you also need to pick and or acquire some hardware. So in my case, I got some Microtech hardware because it's pretty decently priced and it lets me do some, uh, some cool tunneling things. Uh, you also need to get your V4 and V6 space. Um, I listed V6 first because 
in today's world, there, there is no more V4 just openly available. If you want to get V4, you have to buy it from somebody else, go on a waiting list, or get V6 first, and then you're eligible for 1 slash 24 of V4 space to, to help your transition. So you can dual stack servers in there, you can have uh, NATs and stuff in there, um, anything that, you know, that you're needing to do transition on. Uh, you also need to get your ASN, and once you've got all that happening, then you can fire up BGP. And it, it sounds really exciting, and as it turns out, you just you put in a couple commands and then get on the phone with your buddy and make sure that things come up, and then traffic starts flowing just like that. It, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty neat, and... Yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting to happen. <clears throat> uh, and the profit, question mark. Well, that hasn't happened yet. That's why I put the question mark on it. <laughs> so what does BGP look like? So if you've ever, like, uh, interacted with a Cisco router, it looks like this. Uh, there's other platforms that have a syntax that looks pretty much identical to Cisco because most people are familiar with it. Uh, Quagga is one of them, Arista. Um, there's some others as well. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, what does BGP look like on Microtik? Well, Microtik has a nice little Windows application which you can run through Wine. And so you can set up all your, your peers and whatnot in a nice little interface. So these are all the peers that I have. I took the screenshot this morning. Um, I didn't intentionally make it uh, unreadable, but the information isn't actually all that important anyways. The important thing is I have 25 peers, and I think I have about 20 of them active right now. <laughs> and there's uh, the largest peer has about 670,000 routes times two, because I have two connections to my upstream. Um, and then this is the configuration for an individual peer, which is completely unreadable, I see. Uh, basically, it lists the name, um, it lists the, the BGP instance that it's connected to, lists the remote address, uh, lists the remote AS number. That's really important. If you mess up the remote AS, it will not connect. Uh, there's timeout values specified in there. Um, there's filtering specified in there. Uh, and then at the bottom, there's a, a default originate value. So it says never, because I never want to send a default route to my upstream. That would just be silly. They would never want to send the whole internet to me, because it isn't behind me. Um, so types of networks. So this is your, your absolute simplest type of network. This is your, your D-Link router at home. Um, the internal switch might not even be a switch. It might just be several switch ports that are on your router. There's usually no need for BGP in this type of network, um, but it is possible to do BGP in a, in a network like this. You just need to have a lot of IPs behind, so you, it's pretty unlikely that it would actually ever be used in this case. Um, the simple NAT network, as compared to the simplest, has an edge CPE device, and this is usually used in an instance where maybe there's multiple IP addresses. So um, the edge CPE device can either be your own router or it can be your, your provider's router. Um, yeah, often the multiple IP addresses are used for hosting like services or perhaps a mail server or something like that where there's just need to have different traffic appearing as different IP addresses or, or different inbound on different IP addresses. Uh, it is possible to do BGP in this type of situation. Uh, it would depend on how many IP addresses are in use. Um, BGP doesn't necessarily have to be public to the whole world either. If you had two connections to your single ISP, you could do private BGP to your ISP and have redundancy and automatic failover in between two links. And because your firewall is behind the routing device in this case, 
it would never even need to know that anything had changed and things would just keep working. Um, this is a simplified enterprise network. So this is slightly more complex. Um, this one has two edge routers instead of just one. It has a redundant firewall and then there's some internal switching which might include much more switching than that and uh, perhaps a bunch of security devices and whatever else as well. That's why I put simplified in there. <laughs> I didn't want to have to explain or pretend to have full knowledge of enterprise networks. Uh, in this case, um, BGP could be used. I have seen and worked on networks that look much like this. Um, yeah, many networks look a lot like this. This is quite common for BGP networks. Sometimes the firewalls are doing BGP, but it, it's much better if there's a router outside that can do the, the stateless routing and then let the firewalls worry about having their, their connection to the, the edge routing and, and not have to keep state on different interfaces. Uh, okay, good, that did show up. I wasn't sure how that would work. So this is kind of a, a simplified ISP network. So in this case, the ISP has obviously links to other ISPs where they're, they're getting their bandwidth from. Uh, this would be an ISP with no downstream ISPs because there's no customer bubbles. Um, there would be BGP definitely in this type of network. Um, along the, along the right-hand side where the, the, there's the stack of four routers there, those ones say edge routing in between them. I'm not sure how visible that is. Uh, there would be BGP there as well as on the, the inside layer there's two routers uh, that say aggregation routing and those ones would also be participating in BGP as well. Uh, BGP might even go further inside the network than that uh, or they might be using some other routing protocol like OSPF or ISIS which is always interesting to Google these days. <laughs> uh, so this is an example of uh, a carrier network where there's lots of BGP happening all over the place. Uh, every single link in this case is BGP. Um, yeah, so because it's a carrier network, they have mostly other peers. Carriers don't tend to really buy from other carriers. But in this case, I did throw in one upstream and a couple links because yeah, it's possible that it could happen as well too. Uh, so my network. So my network is um, it's kind of a mix of all the networks that you saw here. I have one upstream, I have two routers, both of those routers run BGP. I have uh, several BGP peers, but they're mostly research type peers and not actual traffic. Um, and then I have some edge switching where I have my own VM servers and where all the Tor servers that I that the not-for-profit that I'm part of operates out of. And then I have uh, some virtual connections to my home firewall, which also operates BGP, because I have mm, probably about 10 IP addresses or so at home. And then there's my internal network, which I've simplified down because it's almost embarrassing how complicated my home network is these days. <laughs> Um, so I got my AS at the, the beginning of April of 2016, so you can see this is the bandwidth usage of my whole system for the last two years. Uh, it begins, it's right near the beginning of April. And uh, the reason that the traffic graph looks so strange near the beginning why it grows and then shrinks is that uh, Tor is actually attempting to figure out how much bandwidth is available there. And so they send some and then it's like, well, maybe let's back off on that a little bit or maybe let's give it a little bit more. So that's why it's pretty uneven there. Um, you can see a couple uh, sort of major dips. Those are where we've uh, done hardware maintenance that lasted more than an hour or so or where we maybe had a, a server problem or something like that. You can't see any of the DDoSs on this level of graph, but there, there has been several. 
Uh, total traffic transferred here is 2.1 petabytes in and 2.07 petabytes outbound. Um, so abuse complaints, so obviously because there's seven or eight IP addresses that are used for Tor, I get a fair number of abuse complaints, but given the overall volume of traffic, like we're talking like 800 megabits at peak every day, I only see about 10 complaints a day right now, and it's mostly for SSH stuff. So I've seen uh, 1,394 complaints since August 2016, and I've seen 67 DDoS attacks in, uh, in 2017 alone, which is when I installed my anti-DDoS system. It became necessary. So having fun with BGP. Um, interacting with BGP with your own code. The easiest way to do this is with ExaBGP. It's a Python package. It's very simple. You can write stuff in Python or uh, because it has a very simple API language, you can even write stuff in like bash scripts, which is what I did for my previous B-Sides talk. I've, uh, well, I'll get to that. So reading global BGP routing tables into SQL. So I rewrote this code from the last B-Sides. Uh, previously, this was all done with shell and it was stored in CoachDB and the problem I found was that CoachDB didn't let me index on things that were deep in the data and it made it really difficult to search. So I had to go and use a SQL database. So I rewrote it using some Python stuff. Um, I'm using uh, MySQL. It actually has, it's possible to use IP, type, tible, IP types within, uh, within MySQL, but there's, uh, there's some functions to let you to work with that actually. Um, and I'm using that database data to actually maintain parts of my bgp.guru site right now. So I maintain a list of all the ASs in each province in Canada, and if they're active or not, and if they're advertising v4 or v6, and then some general stats on the number of ASNs that are active in Canada, um, how many have v4, how many have v6, how many are v4 only, how many are v6 only, etc. It's all really easy to make all those stats once that stuff's in a database. Uh, I have a lot of ideas on this, but I have been kind of slow implementing them, unfortunately. Um, something that I have done is HADNS resolver IPs. So one of the most annoying things about operating systems is that you have two DNS servers configured in there and the operating system makes a choice of which DNS server it's going to use and it sends out your query and some new operating systems are a little smarter about this, but generally it waits for five seconds for a response. Now, if it doesn't get that response, it'll try the second one. Sometimes it's smart about remembering that the first one's failed and to use the second one first, sometimes not. So sometimes you end up with massive five second lags on absolutely everything you do because your first DNS server is down. Something that you can do is just make sure that that DNS server is always up or an instance of that DNS server is always up. So I've been doing this by any casting internal resources within my own system. Um, there's a whole bunch of benefits to, to this. Having all the IP addresses up that your clients have configured up uh, solves the, the five second wait problem. Um, you can also load balance your front ends using ECMP. Maybe you shouldn't have just put one thumbs up. I should have put a thumbs up and I kind of like middle because there's some downsides with that too. Um, routing will also pick the local, the, the closest geographic instance of your, your DNS server then. So if you have a large network that covers all of Manitoba and you have a local DNS server that answers your statically configured DNS queries in each community or town and that goes out, well then you just use the next closest one. Um, health checks. Is the service down? We'll just withdraw the route because there's, there's obviously other ones within the system. Um, I have, uh, I'm using this particular uh, 
sysadmin blog exabgp health check script. It's excellent. It's very simple. All you need to do is just specify a command line check that'll return not zero if things are not good, which pretty much every command does already, like dig and curl, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm using this for my own system and also for an ISP that I run. Uh, IPv6 anycasted DNS name server. So <clears throat> I like playing with BGP and uh, experimenting with anycast and unfortunately because v4 space is not readily available anymore I don't have a slash 24 of v4 space that I can like mess around with and advertise so that I can use one IP address out of that slash 24 for an anycast test because that would just be insanely wasteful so I'm using um, a place called dev capsule um, they offer BGP with customers. They're pretty cheap. They have locations in London, Amsterdam, and LA, I think it was. So I fired up some instances. They were, uh, I think, two pounds a month. So like $4 or 450 or something like that a month. So it wasn't insanely expensive. Uh, fired them all up, got stuff all configured out. Um, had to send them... Uh, a letter on my letterhead from my company because they uh, they didn't use IRR values even though they asked for that in the uh, the setup. <clears throat> I see Jonathan doing the face palm over there. <laughs> um, so I found out that these guys don't prefer the local eBGP route and that they only want they only learn one route network wide. So what this means is that. I don't get that, you know, you get the closest geographic instance feature anymore. I just get, there's three backends, and if one of them goes down, the next one will respond, and too bad if the active one is in Amsterdam and you're in North America, or if the active one is in LA and you're in anywhere else other than North America, basically. Um, and uh, as a result, I'm not using this for any, like, production stuff yet. Uh, I'm just doing a, a testing subdomain on it. Um, BGP for list distribution. So this is something that I've played with a little bit. Um, I, I wish I'd play with this more. I need to have an open BGP firewall again, I guess. Um, so one of the cool things with open BSD and open BGP is that it's, it's possible to interact between BGP and PF. Now PF is the, the, the firewall on open BSD, of course. Um, it's possible to, to actually have attributes like communities um, get mapped into like a list of firewall addresses. So if you got routes that were tagged with like the like geographic source tags on them, uh, so, so some networks say that are huge, like global, say, you know, I've learned this, this route in North America or I've learned this route in, in this particular city on their network. So you could say, if you had an attribute like that, that I don't want to accept traffic or send any traffic to anywhere outside of like North America. Of course, you'd find the whole bunch of stuff would break right away because you know there's there's resources that are global all over the world. But if you had say a list of routes that were um, like signed as valid, and then routes that were not signed, you could say, okay, well, I don't want to send any traffic to these routes that are not signed or routes that are, you know, invalid in that case. And you have a much shorter list of routes. And because they're, they're invalid in that sense, you probably wouldn't have the same problems as just indiscriminately blocking traffic outside of like a geographic region. Um, it's also possible that if you get a BGP feed from like a nearby network, so if you're on MTS, if you happen to get a BGP feed from an MTS BGP customer, then you could get um, source ASN, list of prefixes, etc., and you could build all these things into, into firewall policies as well if you wanted. Uh, if you had a whole bunch of distributed firewalls, say, around the world, like you have you know, 15 data centers that operate some website or something like that, and they have OpenBSD firewalls involved, 
You can run BGP between yourself, not install any routes, and just distribute SSH annoyance blacklists. So now when somebody, you know, tries to SSH into your network in, in Winnipeg or something like that, and you have like four attempts, it could communicate that into BGP with XUBGP, and it could distribute that to everywhere around the world in seconds. And so now your SSH annoyance is just blacklisted globally instantly. You could also distribute network whitelists this way. So uh, that would prevent your, you know, if you whitelisted, say, SHA IP space or something like that, then you could say, okay, we will blacklist anybody who's SSH annoying us except for stuff from SHA because we have users that are in that IP space and they tend to forget their passwords. Um, you can also, uh, working with the previous BGP example of a DNS server, you could do a round robin load balance TCP port forwards or UDP port forwards into a table. So that could let you work with like multiple web servers or anything like that. And your firewall policy would be, or your firewall destinations would be controlled through BGP automatically and maybe even health checked. Um, so BGP for black hole injection. So this became necessary after several DDoS attacks flooded my uplink. Uh, it was a way of limiting collateral damage. Um, and I'm using an open source tool called Fast Netmon Community Edition. They recently uh, split from just being a pure open source to a open source slash licensed model, unfortunately. But they're a really good tool. And the, the advanced one that I don't have apparently offers some really cool stuff with, uh, with flow spec, which of course I have no support for. Um, going back to the limiting collateral damage, so like I said, there's, there's seven or eight IP addresses within my slash 24 that are used for Tor. And so obviously people go online and do annoying things and people find out IP addresses and rent little DDoS attacks and try to flood people off the internet which it happens, you know, it's probably people on forums or Tor doesn't do anything UDP, so it would have to be something TCP, which rules out a lot of like interactive gaming. Plus nobody would want a game with one second of latency, not unless you're playing Diablo or something maybe. <laughs> I used to have friends who would play Diablo on satellite with like 900 millisecond ping. It was crazy. <laughs> Uh, so the limiting collateral damage. So basically, when, when one IP address becomes targeted, it just gets dropped instantly. It gets dropped within my own system, gets dropped at my upstream, and then my upstream also sends that on to their upstreams, and it gets blocked anywhere within their network. So um, especially with Hurricane Electric, they have, they have a massive uh, like 8,000 peers or something like that. So everybody likes to send traffic to them. So basically, as soon as that advertisement goes out and hits Hurricane Electric, the, the DDoS stops. And so some, some circuits that are established get killed off, unfortunately. But generally, these DDoS attacks don't last for very long. The longest I've ever had was 15 minutes, and that was before I had any sort of mitigation. Uh, most of them last less than, than two minutes now, especially if you react right away. If you react by just black holing things, people get really bored and just go away. <laughs> it's kind of sad. But it works out really well, and you just drop that IP for two, or I think I've moved it up to five minutes now, um, just to be sure. And, and I've never had like an attack last longer than five minutes now. And so my upstream doesn't get annoyed because there's these massive 10 or 50 or whatever gigabit attacks coming because they just get dropped before they, they get too large. Um, questions, if there's time. Mark? Thank you. Yep. Uh, first of all, just uh, thank you for writing a Tor exit note. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I'm wondering, it's speculative, but do you think the DDoS attacks are coming your way because you're writing a Tor exit note, maybe specifically because people do certain things outbound by your note, and then someone's like, oh, I want to, Go after the person when it comes to you because you were the relay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the question was, is, is running the, the Tor exit relays um, making me a source of DD or uh, a target of DDoS attacks as a result of what users are doing? And the answer is most definitely yes. I've never had any DDoS attacks against any other IP addresses, but the only other people that are on my IP addresses are myself, and I'm not really, I, I, I don't game, and you know, like, I do BGP stuff for fun. <laughs> so, no, no, nobody's like tried to attack any of my like web properties or anything like that, no. It's all attacks against Tor stuff. Uh, so the question was uh, about the number of peers that I have and if they're through tunnels. And yeah, there's mostly through tunnels. So my own home internet runs through two tunnels. Um, because I control both ends of the tunnel, then I can do QoS on both sides, which is really nice. Uh, all my Usenet traffic is like the uh, scavenger class. It's beautiful. Um, and then I offer BGP tunnels for some friends. I have... Uh, some some six in four tunnels and some other types of tunnels. Um, I offer transit over V6 to uh, to somebody else in Germany, who uh, he's the the CTO of the the DECIX German exchange, and so I, I give his personal AS transit um, over a tunnel because I don't know it's a good relationship to have, right? He's the CTO of DECIX. Um. Well, he's like got his AS somewhere in Germany, and so he, he doesn't really do a lot of traffic. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen any traffic on the tunnel. So, so he has a, like a local connection and also a tunnel to your... No, just a, just a tunnel. Well, no, but he would have to have a local connection to get a tunnel to your location. Yeah, yeah, he's got a local connection on his data center, and then he advertises his V6 to them and Hurricane Electric and... And then I think he has also some other peers that are some other people that have their own personal ASs as well. That he gives transit to as well over some other tunnels. Do you have to have a business to have I think so. Oh. Sorry. Really? I think he had an. I think he had a corporation registered as that, though, didn't he? Huh. Maybe you don't, but it was much easier to. Uh, so that I've done multiple requests with Aaron now, and and all of them get looked at differently. It's really weird. My own personal stuff gets scrutinized like you would not believe. Every time I have to go down to the company's office, you know, it's like, oh, get a new certificate, prove you still exist. Where I do requests for other places, and they're. Uh, like, for instance, I did a request for some of this, uh, this transitional IP space in the last week, and other than making the request in the complete wrong category, the, the request went through with zero questions asked. So I think it helps if, you have a, if you're doing it for a company that's like Googleable, <laughs> or it doesn't just have a page that's um, coming soon. Actually, if you if you're dealing with the like the business side of Shaw, so not anything on the cable modems, uh, any circuit that that gets delivered, um, you can at any point talk to them and say, hey, I want to do BGP on this, and I, I did I have done that in the past before with both Shaw and MTS. So it could be the matter of asking. Yeah, yeah, and if you have IP space or you have a, a large enough piece of IP space from them, and you have your own AS, then you can advertise it. So there's a, uh, I did a blog post last year, and I think in September, called Four ASNs Disappear in Atomic Aggregate. It was actually seven, but I didn't update the title because it would have updated the URL. And um, yeah, so that was like seven ASNs locally that disappeared because MTS did an aggregate and, uh, and suppressed all their customer advertisements. But so there was seven customers that were, that were doing that. So it's totally doable, and they've since fixed that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I have a question about the 
I'm not sure. Um, so the question was about whether where this type of stuff can be set up on an Amazon Web Services account, and I'm not sure about that. I've uh, I've never tried to to do BGP with Amazon on on the public side, anyways. Yeah. All right. I think that's that's. Oops, I didn't scroll down to the end. Yeah. Cool, thank you.